Okay, now I'm recording. Um, I will notify you all also that because um, since we started the focus group, I've, I've had most of my content has been directed specifically to this group. And I've not been posting the various sessions outside of this group. This particular one I consider to be of critical importance to the entire company. And so while this discussion we're having now is inside the group, I'm just giving you all the heads up that I will be posting this uh, replay um, in the various sites because I think this information is critical for everybody. When I, um, again, as I did my review a few hours ago and last night for a little while, contemplating what I would talk about today, I look at the various reports. And what I saw, and by the way, thank you, those of you who are sending me reports. It tends to be the same ones who send them to me day after day after day. Um, it's surprising how many people, surprising to me, how many people have still not sent a single report and the number who since last week when I commented on how few had sent a report, uh, even though I send out touchers and teasers for those who had not sent a report, most who had not a week ago still have not today. And so you see, this winds up being a process of self-selection for all of us. And so those of you who are here now, thank you. You self-selected, you opted in, you had another day, you opted in, you had another week. And so congratulations for that. Um, I also wanted to quickly comment on my own results for the last week. My own most recent personal enrollment was yesterday. And uh, that was the first one. As we've been going along, I've been trying to keep you apprised of what exactly the daily flow is for me in the business. And yesterday was the first time that someone has enrolled with me that I communicated with only since we started the focus group. So up until now, I had enrolled five people previously since we started the focus group, but all five of them had been people where I had set the ball in motion sometime in the past. Uh, maybe it was weeks ago, maybe it was months ago, maybe it was years ago, but it wasn't in just the course of the last handful of days. And so the first new personal enrollment that I've done where the contact was made since we started this process was yesterday. And I haven't been counting the days, but I think we're about three weeks in. And so in my own case, finally yesterday that occurred. And remember, I've talked about the very, very predictable nature of our business. It's about 70 days for me is the average. And so most of those people, in fact, all except one that I've enrolled, have been in that 70 day funnel. And when one is brand new, of course, it can happen more quickly because you have a fresh valid circle of influence. That group of people that I've referred to as that low hanging fruit, people who know you, trust you and respect you. Um, there's a greater access to those. When a person is first starting, there's no reason to believe it'll be 70 days. My own experience is, however, that once that initial warmest market has been touched, that it typically is a process, not an event. In this particular case, you've also seen me draw, I draw the picture of the candidate tree. And there are those candidates that we can reach up and touch. These are people who know us, trust us, respect us. Then there are people a little bit higher up on the tree. We know them, they know us, but we're not in that close communication. It's in that group where the skills um, are most important. The warmest market that we have, we don't need to have tremendous inviting skills. We need to have great presentation skills. They'll look past our faults and failings because of their affection for us or their confidence in us. It's those people who know us and we know, but are not close. That's where the biggest pressure is on the skills, knowing what to say, knowing what not to say. So they open their eyes, their ears, and their hearts to the possibility. Those are the people who would tend to ask the question of how's it working for you? And your closest friends, not as likely to ask that, but the person is just more of an acquaintance. How's it working for you? Are you making any money? Um, that then becomes, it becomes very, very important that we know how to invite. So the candidate is focusing on the opportunity being offered as opposed to focusing on the results of the one offering the opportunity. And then I've described the fact that if we just shake the tree, like when I do a social media post, that is not me reaching out and touching somebody that I know. That is just me shaking the tree, realizing there are people up there who can see me that I don't know, that I, that I can't see. And that was the example of the enrollment that I did yesterday. Uh, yesterday's enrollment, the uh, person contacted me, but he contacted me as a result of me shaking the tree only three days ago. So he saw a post that I made three days ago where something that I said provoked his interest. And so that was three days ago. Yesterday, he contacted me. And the truth is, I wasn't even all that enthusiastic about the candidate. I mean, I wasn't. I wasn't that enthusiastic. And that was wrong. That was me making a judgment that I shouldn't have made. Uh, because later, yesterday, yesterday was the day that he reached out to me. I sent him a couple of links like I always do and didn't really think too much of it. And about half an hour later, I got the notice that he had enrolled. And not only had he enrolled, but he enrolled in an annual membership and an executive pack. Um, now, that was simply because um, he was his time was right. It wasn't because I did anything so especially well. His time was right. And when his time was right, he saw me shake the tree. He saw me shake the tree. It provoked interest. Once it provoked the interest, I sent to him the information I thought would be appropriate. 
Um, I personally, I go through a pretty hefty sift. I'm really not looking to enroll people to enroll with a $79 membership. I want to have a 12 month runway in front of me. And so when I send over the video at the very outset that talks about the fact that it's an annual membership, and one of the enrollment packages, then what's that going to do? That is going to thin some people out of my crowd. Some people are going to opt out of that. They're not going to do it. That's okay for me. Um, I would rather enroll fewer people who give themselves a chance for success than I would enroll more people who don't really give themselves for a chance for success. But my, the truth is that when I send off those couple of videos to that gentleman yesterday, I did not expect to hear it back from him. And in fact, I didn't hear back from him. I just got the email from the company saying that he had enrolled and placed the order. And uh, so then I reached out to him and we've got a new member orientation coming up. So what is the point of all that? The point of it is that what has always worked still works. What has always worked still works. And the, the reason that happened for me yesterday was my steady daily activity, the steady consistency. I measure my behaviors. I don't concern myself with the results. Okay, so what is the difference? Why is it that I have this daily consistency and so many people do not? I believe that my daily consistency is a direct, re re is a direct result of the belief that I have first in the direct selling industry. And so I don't, I don't know if um, my friend, I guess you just look here at my, my participant list and see who is here today. I have a friend, there's my friend right there, Steve. And so there's my friend, Steve up in Seattle. And Steve, I would just, I just ask you a question. Because Steve has been candid with me and he's told me that, you know, he's, he's got some belief issues to get past and he hasn't really been making contact with people because he's got these doubts and fears and insecurities about the industry. He, he hasn't really expressed it just that way, but he's told me that he needs to, he needs to have more knowledge. And so Steve, I just want to ask you a question. Whatever the answer is, is okay. And you don't have to answer it verbally. You can shake your head. Yes, you can shake your head. No. Um, would you feel insecure about inviting someone to visit your new medical practice if you had just graduated from medical school and now you are opening up your practice as a new physician, would that make you insecure or would that you would be proud of that, wouldn't you? And you'd be excited to tell them about it, right or wrong? Of course. Yeah. Okay. And so if you would be excited to tell someone about a new medical practice and you wouldn't feel like you were pushing something on them, but you don't make contacts on a daily basis about Nila life then there is the problem. The problem is that you have a perception of what it would mean to be a physician versus what it would mean to be involved in network marketing, right? That is the core problem. And until unless that core problem gets resolved, we're not going anyplace. That, that's the way that it is. And I can, I can look at all of you here. I just each of you ask yourself this question. If you just opened a new hotel in your town, would you feel pushy, obnoxious, aggressive? Would you feel like you were a uh, stepping out there on a limb to tell everybody, you know, hey, I just opened a hotel. That Holiday Inn Express that just opened down on the corner, that's mine. Next time you've got guests come to town, stay there. Would that be easy for you? Yes. Is there anybody you wouldn't tell that to? No, you'd tell everybody. Isn't that right? And I see Renee, she's smiling. Isn't that true? If you open a new restaurant, would you have any hesitation? Oh my God, I better not tell them about my restaurant. What if they go? And I mean, that's not what would happen with it. And so when I see the days, they come and they go and they come and they go and they come and they go. And the vast majority of us don't give someone the chance to opt in or opt out, or we don't give enough people the chance to opt in or opt out, guess what? We don't give enough people the chance, not enough opt-in. And so I contemplated what was the single most important thing that I could share with you today, given what I'm seeing in the daily, in the daily reports. The daily reports are telling me this. If we continue with the same number of daily touches as a group right now that we have, if we continue for the next 75 days or whatever is left, to do the number of daily touches that are happening right now, the goals that you all described for me for the end of the year are highly unlikely to get met. And that's and see that that which is measured can be improved. That's not a negative commentary, isn't it? That's simply a factual commentary. That which is measured can be improved. And so if the problem is that we're not giving enough people the chance to opt in and opt out, and if we can then dig behind that a little bit and say, and what would cause that problem? First and foremost, a lack of belief in ourselves. If our belief in ourselves is high enough, then we are not made fearful by some concept which might be perceived as being controversial in some people's minds. And so the whole core of it all is to have confidence in ourselves. It takes time to develop confidence in ourselves if we don't have it right now. That's a process. And that's not something that I can help you resolve over the course of the next 90 days. What I can do is help you resolve the next most difficult area of lack of confidence and belief, and that is in the fundamental correctness of the network marketing industry. 
those of you who've been around me for a long time, and I know most of your faces, good to see you. Good to see you, Kevin. Hi, Susan. I'm happy to see you. I, I'd like to call you all by name. I don't see you all, but I'm happy you're all here. Um, I, I wish so much if there was one benefit that I have, one advantage, it's that I believe clear to the center of my being. Steve, if I had my choice, if I could either tell somebody, hi, I'm Randy Schrader. I'm really happy to meet you. I'm a cardiac surgeon. If I had my choice of saying that, or hi, I'm Randy Schrader, I'm involved in network marketing. I would rather say, hi, I'm Randy Schrader, I'm involved in network marketing. I would. And because that's the truth, and why would I? Well, because the cardiac surgeon who doesn't show up and provide the service, guess what they get paid? Nothing. They have specialized themselves in a position of zero leverage. And you know what? I don't have any malpractice insurance. I don't have any, I don't have any patients that are suing me. I don't have the government and big pharma telling me all the things that I have to do. Knowing what I know about the medical world and knowing what I know about this world, I would so much rather do what I do. And since, it's, since this is something I'd rather do than be a cardiac surgeon, then it's so easy for me to tell people what I do. And so I thought what I would do is give you all a little bit of a refresher on what exactly has gone on in this network marketing industry for these last 50 or 60 years in the hopes that something I say will get you closer to being across the bridge in believing when you've heard me say over and over and over that I believe that the fundamental principles which govern network marketing or direct selling are superior to those principles to govern conventional business. If the day comes when you believe that like I believe that, then all of a sudden this will stop being difficult and it will start becoming almost ridiculously easy for you. And so I doubt very much if you can read what I've written up here on the board. I didn't have a black pen in my hand and I wrote it in red. So I'll, I'll read you know what it says. Up there, it starts out. Where did it all begin? Well, multi-level marketing all began in 1903. And that was the year that Watkins Company was formed. However, even before that, even before that, you see up before that, it says Avon. Why don't I include that in my, in my chart? Why do I say it started in 1903? Because Avon, when it was formed and for its first 70 years of existence, would simply allow you to buy a product from the company at wholesale and sell it to someone else at a marked up price. It was not multi-level marketing. It was, in fact, purely direct selling. You could buy from the company at one price and sell to someone else at another price. And that company survived and thrived for a long, 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 long time. And frankly, still would have had it not been. And you saw just recently, last few days, that, that, that predecessor to our industry, just finally, I know it was Tupperware, excuse me, Tupperware formed almost at the same time. Avon still survives and thrives. Uh, Tupperware born also in that same generation of time, uh, just went out of business. Why did it go out of business? Not because their model didn't work anymore, but because it got over leveraged, over leveraged, over leveraged, over leveraged as it got bought and sold, bought and sold, bought and sold. Model was still fine. The problem was the amount of debt taken on by various ownership groups as they came along. At any rate, 1903, that was the first time that a company came along and said, hey, Steve, if you want to, you could not just buy products from us and sell them to somebody else and make a little profit at it. But if you'd like to enroll somebody else and benefit from what they do, that was the first company to provide a multi-level payout. So this has been going on then since 1903. That's a long time, folks. The odds of it continuing to go on for a few more years are pretty great because it's been going on since 1903. And there's been every kind of challenge that could possibly be thrown at the industry has been thrown at it since that time. Now, in those earliest years, in 1903, what Watkins said was, Steve, if you want to, you can buy a product from the company at wholesale. You can sell it to somebody else at retail. You can make a little money. You can enroll one person, generation one, and if they buy something from the company, then you can also make a little bit of money on what they do. And they said, if they further that process, one more generation. So it all started in 1903 with personal productivity, buy from the company at wholesale, sell at retail. That then extended two generations. There was two generations of leverage that was possible. And almost immediately began to work. The free enterprise system, the great American dream, it's been around for a long time. And people, in 1903, people would rather work for themselves and for somebody else, just like today. 1903, people needed to make more money. 1903, families wanted to have a little more financial flexibility, just like today. What, uh, what gave rise to the industry then is the same thing that gives rise to its continuation to that. Okay, that then just stayed from 1903 clear until 1959. There were a lot of companies that came and went. Um, and whenever a company succeeds, there are always copies, aren't there? And so uh, Watkins Corporation, that started in 1903. And just a few years later, I mean, five years later, a company called uh, W.T. Raleigh formed. And then Watkins was in Winona, Minnesota, and W.T. Raleigh was a few miles away in Rockport, Illinois. And they uh, completely, totally knocked, knocked it off. That's what they did. 
And you know what? Most of you have probably heard of Watkins Corporation, if, if only because you've heard of me, heard me talking. Do you know what? Watkins still exists. They did $80 million in sales last year. Been around since 1903. And last year, they did $80 million in sales. They still are homed in, um, in Monona, Minnesota. Well, at any rate, nothing really significant happened in the industry, clear until 1959. And in 1959, two people that you've heard of, I'm guessing you've heard their names, Rich DeVos and Jay Van Andel, they said, this is a bigger idea than is being put forward by our predecessors. They weren't the first ones. A lot of people would say this industry started then. That is not the truth. The industry had been going on for more than 50 years. It had been 50 years of trial and error, 50 years of finding out what kind of products worked, 50 years of finding out what, how did you need to pay people to make it work? All that had been going on in the background. Here came Rich DeVos and Jay Van Andel. And I'm not sure if we're going to get all the way through to today. I don't know because the parts that are really important, I'm going to, I'm going to spend some time on. And this next thought, when we contemplate and consider what was the single biggest contributor, contribution that Amway made and has made to our industry. There are three or four major, major contributions. The first big contribution that Amway made was they were the first company that said you can not only get paid for your own productivity and two generations deep, but they said we'll pay you on the third generation. Well, as you know, the way that leverage works, if we enroll two people, the way the math works out, those two will ultimately wind up enrolling four and those four will ultimately wind up enrolling eight. And so when they went to that third generation, that more than doubled the income possibility that existed. So in 1959, that was the first time when there was only a two level payout, it was literally a mathematic impossibility for a person to generate full-time income doing it. When Amway came along, they made two important, two important decisions. The first decision was they said, we will not allow a person to grow and graduate in the compensation plan unless they have quite significant personal productivity. They required personal group volume. Now, as compensation plans went on and moved on, in fact, in order to become an Amway direct, going clear back to 1959, you had to do $5,000 in monthly personal productivity. And that number fluctuated over the years. It became larger as time went on. But they required that a person become skillful and successful in their own rights. You had to be doing five to $7,000 in monthly personal productivity before you were allowed to go out and enroll other people and get paid for what other people did. Now, that was an important lesson, and it's a lesson that has been, by and large, forgotten and not validated by our industry. That's one lesson that we need to go back to. Every single one of us needs to be responsible for four or five or $6,000 in monthly personal productivity. We all need to wrap our arms around that idea. We need to be doing four, five, six thousand dollars $6,000 in personal productivity. Amway's existed now since 1959, and it's existed in large measure because they require that people do personal productivity. They do not allow one to simply go out and enroll another and have somebody else take them all the way home. Demand it, that they develop a clientele on their own, a customer base, that they have personal production. I'm going to encourage myself, and as I encourage myself, obviously I'm encouraging you too, let us wrap our arms around the idea that we need personal production as well. There's a reason that Amway's still around since 1959. There's a reason last year they did more than $10 billion in sales when so many companies have come and gone. And it's because they created a leadership foundation where people were required to develop personal productivity skills in advance of worrying about recruiting skills. It's an important lesson. It's not one that we should forget. The next thing that Amway did that was really important to me and will one day be important to you. Amway was the first company to prove that it is possible to have what I've come to describe as multiple S curves. And here's what I mean by that. All companies, whether it be a network marketing company or what other method of distribution, will have an X axis and a Y axis. All companies start on the bottom left-hand corner of the graph. The vast majority of companies in or out of network marketing will finish on the bottom left-hand corner. They will never get off the ground floor. Every once in a while, and it's not very often, but every once in a while, a new company will come along whose product, service, concept, opportunity, whatever they are, whatever they propose in totality, when it stops being obscure and starts to become popularized, when it stops being something that no one's heard of, and now it starts being something that you hear chatter about, it stops being obscure and it starts to become popularized. Well, going clear back to the earliest days, and I'm going back now to, the, let's talk about the years between 1959 and 1972, at that point in time, um, Amway was doing business only in the United States of America. Amway, the American way, is what the company was named, Amway. There was no thought of doing the business outside of the United States at that point in time. 
And there was, it was the first time that people began contemplating, considering that this concept of critical mass, critical mass being what? You've heard me talk about the idea that if we were to, if it was the wintertime, I live in the mountains of Utah, and if I were stranded out in, out in the mountains in the wintertime and there's four feet of fresh snow around me, um, I would uh, look really, really hard to find some dry, dry wood. And I would look to find some little wood that I could break into kindling. And if I only had two or three matches, I promise you, I'd be really, really careful. And I would tend to that fire. I wouldn't, I wouldn't just get it ignited and then move away. No, I would tend to that fire and I would make sure that I had a bed of coals before I thought of walking over the neck ridge to build another bed, to build another fire. I would make sure I had a bed of coals. This idea of critical mass, it's when Steve, you've built a bed of coals in Seattle and that bed of coals grows and it grows and it grows. You know, pretty soon that bed of coals extends halfway down to Portland and about halfway down to Portland, it's intersected a bed of coals that was growing up towards you from someone who started the same thing there. And so that bed of coals, it spreads east and west and it spreads north and south. And what was discovered in about the year 72, 75, it was discovered that if a company in this method of distribution could aggregate about $50 million, 50 million US dollars in sales in a year, that then that would be enough. There would be enough people who were making money, maybe doing $50 million in sales. That's going to create some checks, right? There would be enough people making enough money that they could take the show on the road, that they could go out and represent as a leader and tell a person's making money. As we know, it doesn't matter too much how much knowledge we have minus proof of income. That knowledge is fairly hollow. And so what was discovered is that about that $50 million mark, there would be enough people making enough money that they could then afford to travel and that they would then have that imprimatur, that voice of authority because of their successes. Also true that at about that $50 million in sales mark, that would be where enough people were having positive product experiences. Uh, right now, we have some really, really remarkable product experiences with Stellamar. But how many do we have? I mean, there are 325 million people in America. How many people have seen, touched, tasted, felt, consumed Stellamar? Like a really, really, really small number, right? There's no way that there's chatter. There's no chatter. That's not the truth. When will there be chatter? Well, about $50 million in sales. $50 million in consumption of the product. That's when you have enough people who are talking about what it's done for them. And obviously we know that it takes a while to get there. And so all companies start on the bottom left-hand corner of the graph. Most of them finish there. But those who have a product or service or opportunity that gets traction, when that continues to grow, about the time it reaches $50 million in annual sales, that's when you have enough people making money. It's when you have enough people that are having positive product experiences that now you go to a cocktail party, you go to the bowling alley, you go to the football game, and you hear somebody over there talking about it. And you hear somebody over there talking about it. You don't know for sure what they're talking about, but they're talking about something. Okay, that's critical mass. That's when suddenly this bed of coals is coming together. And now I'm looking at Corey. So Corey, if you've got a piece of wood and you try to light it with a match, it won't light. But if you have a bed of coals, you can drop a log on it and it will light. Isn't that right? And so this whole idea of critical mass is having a bed of coals, having enough people having a positive product experience and enough people having a positive income experience that now that ignites the next person who touches it. So when is the hardest work in, this, in a company like ours? The hardest work is trying to get it from the point of inception to the point of critical mass. We are living in the hardest work. This is the most difficult time. It's the time that's most exciting. It's the time that people, oh my gosh, people chatter about it, but then they get involved and they find that, oh wow, there's no critical mass. I thought it'd be so fun to be first. Nobody's talking about this product. Nobody's making any money. This sounded so much more exciting than it turns out that it is. And it's, it's not really exciting when you're down here in the bottom left-hand corner of the graph. There is no critical mass. No one's heard about it. No one really believes in the validity of it. It's heavy lifting. That's what you, that is what we, that is what I, that is what we're all living through right now. I am grateful for every single day of it. I don't wish, do not wish away these moments. Don't wish them away. Because when it hits that moment of critical mass and transitions into the next period of growth, your ultimate income in this company will depend more on what did you do before it became popularized than will ever be the truth about what you do after it becomes popularized or as it is becoming popularized. So these are the heavy lifting days. These are also the days that have the greatest dollar bill sign behind them for those who are able to become a part of that foundation of leadership. Okay, so then... What happens? Now we finally reach this point in time. So to make this real, Amway starts in 1959. In 1959, they just grew and grew and grew and grew. Steady, consistent growth. They grew, they grew, they grew, they grew, they grew. 
And then something absolutely incredible happened. I mean, it was absolutely flat, stinking, incredible. By the time we got 10 years into it, here comes about 1969. And now they hit that $50 million in sales. You know what happened between 1969 and 1972? It went from $60 million in sales to $600 million in sales annually, all in one nation, the good old US of A. That's what happens when it stops being obscure and it starts to become popularized. And you know who got paid for that? Not the people who were there during the transition because it simply happened too fast. It went from $50 million in sales to, it went from $50 million in sales to $600 million in sales in a handful of years. That was too fast. If Steve, if you got involved right here, bang, it happened too fast for that growth to impact you. It was happening all around you, but it didn't accrue to your benefit. To whose benefit did it accrue? It accrued to the benefit of these people who were back here walking through that slowly drying concrete. There was no bed of coals. Nobody was making any money. There didn't seem to be any leadership available. Chaos all around, right? Those are the people who get paid when the transition occurs. Whatever we get paid as we create the foundation upon which others build, whatever we get paid is fine. It will not be enough. I promise you there will not be a person on this session who makes enough money during the time when the foundation is being laid that you say, wow, that was incredible. It's not the truth. No matter what you earn, you won't feel like you're earning as much as you're working for during the period of time when the foundation is being built. You are investing today. You are investing your time and the reward will come when the company's product, service, or opportunity stops being obscured, starts to become popularized. And so then what happened? Well, here we go. It took 10 years to get to that point. 10 years, the bed of coals has grown. Now, am I telling you it's going to take 10 years? No, I'm telling you, I don't know how long it will take. I don't know. I don't know. I have my ideas and my opinions. I don't believe it'll take 10 years, but it won't happen overnight either. Because why? Because leadership foundations are not created overnight. That is not the truth. Uh, this group of individuals has to melt together into one leadership structure. A lot of things have to happen before it stops being obscure and starts to become popularized. Well, suddenly, straight up vertical thrust. Now, whenever something starts to go really, really, really well, something really starts to go well, then you can anticipate that other people are going to try to stop it from continuing to go well. That's the way that human nature is. It starts to really go well. Somebody else is making money and I'm not. Human nature is, I'm going to blame somebody about that. I mean, hopefully I would never do that, but lots of people do. And, and also, as it starts to spike, then... Ben Bernanke, when he was the chairman of the Federal Reserve Board, he talked about uh, a time when the U.S. stock market was just going crazy. I mean, it was going crazy. And there are certain values that determine what a stock price should be. Uh, one is called a multiple. Uh, how, how many times last year's earnings is the stock worth now? If it earned $10 in gross earnings last year, then there'll be a multiple put on that. In today's market, it's an expensive market. That multiple is about 20 times. And so if a stock earned $10, then you'd take that $10 times 20, and that's about what the share price would be in today's market. And so if there's a stock who is trading at 30 times earnings, well, that's irrational. That's irrational. You're paying too much for it. The other way that one would determine the value of a stock is by looking at its dividend yield. If the dividend yield on the S&P is about 1.7%, if um, stock prices keep going higher and the dividends stay the same, then that dividend yield as a percentage goes down. It's not as much. Well, if a stock price goes high enough that the dividend yield is no longer on the historic norm or the multiple is too high, that's irrational exuberance and the stock price needs to stop going up and go down to re-intersect those fundamental values. So Ben Bernanke talked about the irrational exuberance at a time when the market was spiking, that it's going up too far too fast. That's what this is. In the network marketing industry, it's frequently been called momentum. I want you to know that I'm not interested in provoking a momentum surge. Why? because behind every momentum surge is a steep retraction. I'm not interested in a steep retraction. What I would like is to, yes, have a steeper period of growth, but I would like to have the leadership knowledge, wisdom, ability. I would like us to create a leadership structure that doesn't provoke this over-rational exuberance. Another way of thinking about over-rational exuberance, those gals out there, or you guys that cook, if you put a pot on the stove and you turn the heat on high, when the pot boils, then if you pull the pot off the stove, if it's overboiled, there won't be as much water left, will there? 
that's what happens if it goes too far too fast. What we really want is to create a curve that looks more like this over time, not too interested in creating these because they create these steep pullbacks. That's what always happens. Now we'll find out as time goes on how successfully we're able to navigate those waters. Right now we're down here, still working on creating the foundation upon which others will build. Certainly by no stretch of the imagination is our company, a product, our service, or opportunity uh, popularized, nor is it anywhere close to becoming that right now. Okay, so now, 10 years to get to this point, suddenly, suddenly, like it's magic, it stops being obscure, starts to become popularized, goes straight up. When it goes straight up, then there starts to be this irrational exuberance. Then uh, people start making income claims they shouldn't make. People start saying things that maybe you're not completely founded in fact. And that, by the way, doesn't mean that they're lying. It means that an optimistic person is repeating something somebody else said that was wrong. You know, we, I can say something that's wrong without being a liar. I can, I can repeat something I was told that I believed. And so that's what tip is, that's typically what happens here. This is not about people intentionally not telling the truth. It's irrational exuberance. It's saying things that can't be backed up in fact. When the spike, when the, when the arrow goes too high, too fast, then there will always be regulatory scrutiny and pressure. And so this came in 1972. 1972, the Federal Trade Commission, um, District Court, State of Michigan, said that Amway, what you're doing is not illegal. This uh, violates, um, then they, they wrote the first pyramid laws, that this is illegal, you've got to stop. And, and so now, and I remember it, by the way, I remember it, I wasn't very old then, but I remember Mike Wallace on 60 Minutes talking about Amway being a pyramid, just raking Rich DeVos and Jay Van Abel over the coals. I remember it really, really well. Okay, and so then what happened? Well, in that environment, when the United States government says it's illegal and it's a pyramid, well, Corey, it was hard to recruit the next day. Right, really, really, really hard to recruit that next day. Something magical happened, absolutely magical. This happened at six hundred million dollars in annual sales, doing six hundred million dollars. The FTC came out and said that's a pyramid. You can't do it. State of Michigan um, sued Amway, and all kinds of challenging things happened. And you know what took place? You know what happened to the volume? It didn't go down. It didn't go down because why? Because all of those people had been taught they had to have personal groups. They were doing five and seven and ten thousand dollars in monthly volume themselves. Those people who were buying the products were not enrolling in the company. It wasn't about the business; it was about the product offering. The stability was created by the product viability and by the fact that people said, "Well, wait a minute. I mean, it, my shoe polish and soap is working just fine. My SA8 is still doing exactly what it did before before Mike Wallace said this was a pyramid." And I, I can't see that a darn thing that Mike Wallace said about this company is impacting the value that I'm getting from the product. And so it stopped growing. I mean, it literally stopped growing. It was going straight up and it stopped, but it didn't go down. It didn't go down. It stayed right there at $600 million in sales. And then it went along like that from 1972 clear until 1979, seven years worth of litigation. And then in 1979 came the Amway ruling. And the Amway ruling was absolutely, it was so important to all of us. So you can imagine a football field a football field has what? It has a 50-yard line. It has end zones. It has um, hash markers along the sideline here. It has 20-yard lines and so on. The Amway ruling in 1979 identified the playing field. It said, this is what you can do. And by the way, the Amway ruling said that Amway is not a pyramid, that this is a legal and legitimate way to move products to end-line users, and it is a legal way to generate income. That's what the Amway ruling says. If you're inside the playing field. And so every once in a while, we'll see, in fact, not every once in a while, quite frequently, we will see companies that get called into question by the Federal Trade Commission, by various regulatory agencies. Why is that? Well, because companies do launch outside of the playing field. And when they're outside of the playing field, when they are subjected to the scrutiny, then they don't survive. Then they are shut down. That's what happens. But, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about Herbalife here in a while. But for those of you who've been around for a while, you might remember that Mark Hughes, who was the founder of Herbalife, he was called to testify at the United States Senate. They were accusing that company of being a pyramid. And you know what? They were wrong. They were wrong. They didn't slow Herbalife down. And uh, just a couple of years ago, Bill Ackman, one of the biggest voices on Wall Street, and took a billion-dollar short position in Herbalife, tried to bring it down. And you know what? That billion-dollar short position cost him a billion dollars because he was wrong. Why was he wrong? Because the Herbalife compensation plan is inside the playing field. Every once in a while, you'll see companies get called into question and they will survive the scrutiny. Well, why would they get called into the question in the first place? Well, an example would be 
Newskin in 1990 was sued by the Federal Trade Commission, was accused of being a pyramid scheme, and they did all they possibly could to shut that company down. Newskin is enormously larger today than when that happened. When that took place, they were doing about $40 million in annual sales. Today, they do about $40 million in monthly sales. Today, they do $200 million in monthly sales. Federal Trade Commission was dead wrong. They were wrong. Why? Because when, when a judge and a jury looked carefully at the compensation plan, they said, you know what? They might be on the one foot line. I'm not an advocate for that compensation plan. It's unbelievably difficult. I think that it's unfair, but it's not illegal. It's inside the Amway ruling. And that's why the company didn't just survive, but has thrived since then. It would be a really smart thing for all of you who don't understand what the Amway ruling is. Because the very time that you know what I know, when you know that our compensation plan is not just inside the playing field, but it's on about the 50-yard line inside the hash markers, then you will no longer get questions about is this a pyramid. When you know it's not, people don't ask. If you don't know whether or not it is, then people will ask because they will sense your own doubt and fear. And if they sense your doubt and fear, they will not take any action. Well, what happened? And we got up here, got completely, the growth had just stopped. Then in 1979 comes the Amway ruling. And when the Amway ruling came, then something changed. See, back here, it had been about a handful of consumer products, shoe polish and soap, the free enterprise system. And then they went through an entire seven-year period trying to prove that their method of doing business was legitimate, and they won with the Amway ruling of 1979. And um, then something dramatic happened. Amway had the second. Remember, I said this concept was multiple S-curves. Amway had their second S-curve, and it was dramatically bigger than the first one. It took the company from uh, $600 million in sales to $2.5 billion in sales, all still inside the United States of America. How did that happen? Dramatic product line extension. And I want you guys to think about all these things I'm talking about. Dramatic product line extension. What do you see our company doing right now? Month after month after month after month, you see product line extension. Our job is to create a consuming network. The company's job is to continue to deliver products to our e-commerce site that will cause that extended product line to result in increased buying from our existing membership and to also give our existing membership something new to say to the next candidate. I want you to know that our model, our entire business model, is patterned after carefully reviewing the Amway ruling and understanding what we can do in today's environment to fully leverage that ruling. I promise you folks that what's going on is not luck and happenstance and it's not maybe we should try this or we should try that. It is based upon a whole lot of history in this industry. What could we do today to leverage what has gone on in the past and to forecast the future a little bit? Okay, and so now here came that second escort and it went from the great American dream, free enterprise system, shoe polish and soap, handful of consumer items. And then it became anything you want to buy, you can buy from Amway. If you want to buy Michelin tires, you can buy them from Amway. If you want to buy Firestone tires, you can buy them from Amway. Truth is, if you want to buy a Toyota, you can buy it from Amway. You can get whatever telephone service you want from Amway. And so you see it went from a handful of products to literally anything you want to buy. You can buy it from Amway. And so their brilliance was what? They created this incredibly loyal, impassioned, incredibly loyal, impassioned membership. And when that incredibly loyal, impassioned membership is introduced to a new product, what do they do? They shift their buying habits. And that is why, you know, you hear so many people saying, oh, the network marketing industry has changed. Of course it's changed. It's been changing from the very first day that it started. We all have to be changing. But there are no changes that have gone on that would invalidate the very same principles that gave Amway rise the very first day. Create a product or service that matters to people, deliver it for a reasonable price, create a community that's encouraging and empowering, help people learn, grow, develop, and become more, and then extend the product offering so they can ship more of their consuming into it. That then creates opportunity for those who made that happen. Okay, now what happened next? Every single time there is one of these vertical thrusts and the vertical thrusts always follow a period of foundation building. So here we have this period of foundation building, getting the company off the ground, the steep spike, then seven years, seven years of backing and filling, seven years of creating the next tiers, the foundation, then boom. The next surge went from $600 million in sales to $2.4 billion. It was much bigger. And then Amway, a few years later, did us all the most tremendous service of all. They had the third S-curve, and that one was provoked by what? Dramatic multinational expansion. Now, the great American dream, the free enterprise system, not just shoe polish and soap. You can buy anything you want. To You can buy anything you want anywhere in the world. And that is why Amway continues to be a $10 billion annual sales industry. And that is why the biggest earners in the history of the network marketing industry in terms of total earnings and in terms of current monthly and annual earnings are Amway distributors. That is why. 
because they are the first company in our industry to prove 50 years longevity with multiple S curves. Say, so, wait a minute, Randy. Watkins has been around since 1903. Yes, but they've not had multiple S curves. They didn't find a way to expand their product line into other areas. They didn't stay current. They still are delivering that same handful of items that they were delivering all those years ago to an incredibly loyal buying group, but they didn't have these multiple S curves. Okay. Well, Amway's done a lot for us, but what the most important thing they did was fight the fight that created the playing field so that we can know that what we're doing is legal and legitimate. The next most important thing they did for us was prove that this doesn't have to be just a short cycle. Carol, it's fantastic because you're first. No, it's fantastic because you're first. But if we do it right, we can create multiple S-curve opportunities for people who are not first. And, and really, if it's only good because we're first, then shame on all, us, all of us if we do it. We need to have confidence that it can play its way out for literally decades. Otherwise, what we're doing is choosing to earn because of our moment in timing. And that's not, that doesn't imply integrity and goodwill in my estimation. Okay, so that was Amway, 1959. That tells you the story from 1959 well past that. Um, in the 70s, what happened? In the 70s, almost entirely because of what Amway had proven, specifically with the Amway ruling. If Amway had not proven the legitimacy and legality of the business with the Amway ruling, then none of the other things that followed since then would have happened, that would, that would have ended. And so then other companies came along and they said, wait, Amway did the heavy lifting for us. They proved it. So then we saw in the 70s, a few companies um, enter the arena, Forever Living Products is a company that still survives and thrives and does a couple hundred million dollars in annual sales. Uh, Primerica was once called A.L. Williams, was the first company to bring this to uh, use a multi-level marketing uh, component in the financial services, specifically term life insurance extended beyond that. Uh, those companies are significant companies that started in the 70s. They still survive and thrive today. The next big, big, big shift in the network marketing industry happened in the 1980s. This was the shift that resulted in me being involved in the business. In the 1980s, um, companies like New Skin, Melaleuca, Herbalife, NSA, National Safety Associates, Niken, uh, Sunrider, you can look at the vast majority of the larger companies that are out there on the horizon today. Uh, the big names in the industry, they were all in this iteration of time of the 1980s. And what happened during that period of time is that was the first time when technology made it possible. Remember up here, Watkins paid on two levels and up here, Amway paid on three levels. But if each of you were to look at the amount of money that you earn on your first three levels, it's not very much, is it? So what was the brilliance in Amway's program? Corey, they could create great big checks because people weren't told to just be personally active. They were taught, do $5,000 in personal productivity. You can make a lot of money if you have an organization of people three generations deep who are all doing five or six or 10 or $12,000 in monthly volume. So let us all learn a lesson. Let's learn from that. Let's not be satisfied with just enrolling people who are qualified in the compensation plan. We've got incredible products to offer. Let's bring people into the business who develop customers as well as business builders. Let's all recognize that you can earn a career type living in this business with only a three level payout if people are not simply qualifying for $79 or $59, if they're actually creating a customer base. Really, really, really important for us. That's a lesson that we, that we should learn from Amway and that most companies have not. Okay, well, here came New Skin Herbalife, Nikan Sunrider, a whole bunch of others. And I said, you know what? Technology has changed. I remember, some of you are my age. And isn't it incredible what's happened to technology in our life? I mean, Renee, I think when, you, when you look at what your grandchildren do today with their iPads and their tablets, Think of when you were six years old. It's a different planet, isn't it? I mean, it's a complete, totally different planet. Well, part of that changing of the planet was technology making it possible for compensation plans to pay in further depth. It wasn't really an unwillingness to do so back here. It was there was no methodology to do it. It just it didn't exist. You couldn't pencil that stuff out. And so then technology changed. When technology changed, that was when companies like all these and many, many, many more started in that generation of time. And they said, we can pay on six levels of debt. That changed the industry. That's what made room in it for me. Because now suddenly the dramatic leverage, remember, we all have our own experiences prior to getting involved in this. I was used to earning $400,000 a year as a stockbroker. And yes, there were two or three people in Amway that were earning that amount of money, but it was two or three. And I couldn't, I would not have been able to transition from being a vice president at Merrill Lynch to doing network marketing full-time had this generation of companies not come along and said, you can pay more in depth. 
mean, Renee, you and I weren't in business together at that point in time, but you know, I earned over $150,000 a month on just my sixth generation for over a decade uh, because the compensation plan I was involved with paid in that debt. You see, that made room for people who were not simply looking to augment their income or make secondary income. And it made room for people who had great other opportunities and great other possibilities in their lives. Uh, most people didn't look at it. Why didn't they look? Because whenever there's this vertical thrust, there is something that stops the vertical thrust. In this case, what stopped the vertical thrust? Litigation. The United States government said, this is not legal. What stopped the vertical thrust up here? Folks, this was over $2 billion in sales being done just in the United States of America. It, had, it was not just that this point of critical mass had been reached where you would hear people talking about it. It had reached a point of dramatic name saturation. Notice I said name saturation, not real saturation. There's no such thing as real saturation. Look at the amount of volume that uh, is done right now by Amazon. So, so there is no real saturation. There's only name or perceived saturation. But way too many of us, as it reached the peak of its second S curve, too many of us went to pool parties. We thought we were going to barbecue. And at the most inopportune moment, we found out it was an Amway meeting. Right? That's what happened. And there came a time when people wouldn't even admit that it was Amway. They started making up new names for it. Then the company actually changed its name. Oh, no, it's not Amway. It's Quick Start. It had nothing to do with Amway. Well, it was Amway. It was a different name. You see, name saturation didn't give it the exact, the exact same cataclysmic stop to that vertical progression, but it still did the same thing. It was a more gradual cessation, but it was a cessation. It was an unavoidable thing. Name saturation, poor name management. We had all decided, we didn't even know what Amway was, but we all knew we weren't going to do it. And so that's what stopped that second thrust. And in order for them to have their next wave, they had to move outside the borders of the United States because they had literally destroyed their name and image domestically, even though they were doing such a tremendous business. Their, their membership practices, not the company's practices, but the membership practices in not properly describing what the business was resulted in name saturation and it resulted in the cessation of that second S-curve. Then they had to figure it out, go through another period of stabilization. And then the next S-curve came along with multinational expansion where literally anywhere in the world you can buy anything you want, man, like corporation. Okay, so now we come back over here. And what we saw was an enormous wave of companies come into the business who were leveraging the now available technology so that we could get paid in greater depth. It's always really easy to look back. Um, hindsight is such a beautiful thing. Foresight is so much more difficult. And none of us knew, I didn't know. I got involved in NewScan on February 1st of 1990. And I did not understand at that point in time that the very same compensation plan that drew me would be penalizing to others. This is the way that it went. And I, I, and I recognize that all this stuff might not be interesting to you. It's really, really interesting to me because this is the way I've invested my life. This is like really, really interesting to me. I don't know, but it doesn't drive you, drive you guys nuts. But here's the way that it looks. All of these companies, all of these companies in this iteration of time, they all were operating with a compensation plan that was remarkably similar one to another. And that compensation plan was called stair-step breakaway. Most of these companies still are operating a stair-step breakaway. They are legal, but the fact that they're legal doesn't mean that they're fair. It doesn't mean that most people would have any chance of becoming profitable in it. So the way that it worked was this. If this was Randy and I became a new skin distributor and each of you just consider, compare this to your experience. If I became a new skin distributor, the first thing that I had to do was I had to enroll and of course, in all companies, it's not, it's not legal for the company to require you to buy a package, a product package. But basically, my upline told me if I didn't, then you know, I had no prayer. And so then I spent my $500 on my product package way back then. And then the way that it worked is this. I had my personal group. Remember coming back here to Amway? I said that Amway's people, they had to do $5,000 in volume. And if they didn't, then they couldn't begin to go out and recruit. Okay, well, that principle was brought over here. And over here, one had to do $3,000 in volume, three months in a row. And so if I enrolled 10 people, then I would only get paid on the personal orders of those 10 people. And so my first month, my very first month ever in network marketing, I did $15,600 in business. I only got paid a tiny commission on those that I had personally enrolled. And as a result of doing $15,600 in business, my first commission check was $110. Well, that's pretty brutal, isn't it? That's kind of tough. 
But I was being told, Randy, this is the way that it is. And it's all going to work out fine for you over time. And I bought into the idea. So I said, fun. The next month, I had to do 3,000 volume points three months in a row. If I didn't do 3,000 volume points three months in a row, then I could never get paid past just this group right here. And so the next month, my group did about $35,000 in business, and I got paid less than $200. The next month, my group did $51,000 in business, and I got paid 386 bucks. So I had done a total of almost $100,000 in business for the company, and I had been paid less than $1,000 in income. I was earning less than 1% on volume. That's the way that it was. But then the next month, what happened? The next month, I became an executive, and now I could get paid between nine and 12 for nine and 14 percent on this entire group. And so I earned one hundred dollars, one hundred dollars, two hundred dollars, three hundred dollars, four hundred dollars. And then the next month, my check went to two thousand ten thousand two hundred and twelve. So my fifth month in the industry of network marketing, I earned ten thousand two hundred and twelve dollars. But you know what? The vast majority of people never did that three thousand three or four months in a row. And so they never got past these little teeny tiny figures. Um, and then what occurred was this. Now, let's assume for a moment that Corey, he does his 3,000 three months in a row too. At that point, he would break away. That's why it was called a stair-step breakaway program. He'd break away from me. And now his 3,000 volume points would not count towards my monthly requirement. I'd have to go and replace him. What was the difference? Over here, Amway was teaching people, satisfy your monthly requirement with customer volume. What I was doing was satisfying my, month, my compensation plan requirement with distributor volume. Those distributors didn't want to stay in my group. They wanted to break away. And so it literally was creating, when we think of one of the negatives you'll hear of in network marketing, you'll hear people talking about, quote, front-end loading. You don't hear it very much anymore because basically been legislated out of existence. But at the time that I got involved in the industry, people would sometimes spend $50,000 to join NSA because they would buy $50,000 worth of water filters. You know what? 50000 bucks is a lot of water filters and $119 a shop. They'd have those things stacked in their garage for the next six months. You know, clear until they finally took them to the dumpster is what would happen. That was the truth. And so front end loading, well, that was all the evil that we talked about. No front end loading, no front end loading, no front end loading. I found out there's a bigger evil than front end loading. You can only get front end loaded once. I mean, Steve, what if you spent 20 grand to join this company, but you did it one time? Well, that's better than, that's better than spending $5,000 month after month after month after month. And that's what was happening. Why? Because if Corey broke away from me, now his volume doesn't count in my 3,000. I don't have customers. I just have distributors. He breaks away. I don't get to count his volume anymore. But then the way the rules worked then and still work today is that if I didn't do my 3,000 volume points every month, what if I've got a million dollars in volume down here and I'm getting paid 5% on that? I'm making 50 grand a month. Corey, if I didn't do my 3,000 every single month, miss it one month, then they take my group away from me permanently. It's forever gone. And so if you've got volume down there, then what do you do? You just buy it. You know, if your check is going to be 3,001 and it takes 3,000 to get it, then you spend 3,000 to get the check for 3,001. Back-end volume is the killer of a stair-step breakaway. Back-end loading, not front-end loading. And so when a few years, a little while later, Newskin was questioned, they were questioned on this back-end loading issue. Well, it turns out that that's a really bad idea, but it's not an illegal idea. And that's why they still exist. And they really haven't made very many changes to that. Uh, what, it, what it creates is an incredibly powerful leadership group among those who survive. But it means that very, very few will survive. Those few who do survive will be leaders, true leaders. And so what the industry has tried to do since that time, since that iteration of compensation, is find a way to reward the true leader, but to do it in such a way that you're not penalizing those who may not have those same capacities to not be hurting those who don't have the ability to, to meet those harsh, harsh comp plan requirements. And so over here, what these companies did was they showed that it was possible to get paid further in depth. They also identified a, not a fatal, because the company still exists, but a very, very challenging flaw in a stair-step breakaway, which is not front-end loading, but it is back-end loading, where people month after month after month after month have to stay qualified or lose their groups. That is still the way that all of these companies work. So again, the fact that something is legal does not mean that it's something that I'd be enthusiastic about as I think you should be enthusiastic about. Okay, next we move on to the 1990s. Now, I should ask you all a question. First, I gotta look and see what time it is. The first question I should ask you is, does all of this matter to you? You know, if it doesn't matter to you, then I don't need to tell you. Does it matter to you? If it does, then there's, there's another hour's worth of information you need to know. If it just doesn't matter to you, then I don't want to talk to you because it matters to me. 
<laughs> and so um, I, I want you to know, so Ryan says it does matter. A, a few more of you, tell me. Do you guys want the other half of this story or do you not? Do you want it? Okay. So um, because we've already been talking for an hour and because um, I don't want to shortchange any of the really important information that comes behind this, what happens from this point forward is much more important to you and to us today. This is kind of ancient history. It created the foundation for the industry, but most of this stuff would only be of interest to somebody who's decided this is what their life is about, but you really want to understand this top to bottom, inside and out. What happens now though, from this point forward, we move on now in the 1980s was stair step breakaway, um, that was also the first forced matrix compensation plan. We'll talk about that a little bit as we go on. But this was dominated by a stair-step breakaway structure. And those structures, I am not critical of them because many of the largest direct selling companies who have had the greatest longevity in our industry were formed during that period of time and continue to operate those plans. I don't believe you could successfully launch a company with those plans today. The market has moved past that. In the 1990s, here came USANA is the one company that I'll talk about in the 1990s and a compensation um, strategy introduced by that company called Binary. And we'll talk about the, the pluses and the minuses to that. And then from the 1990s, it goes on to 2000 through 2010. There were some other significant changes that happened in the industry. And then 2020, and finally, what I consider Needle Life to be, when you've heard me talking about the fact that this is not simply a it's not a period, it's not a comma, it's not an exclamation point, it's not a turning of the page. This is an entire new volume. Uh, what Needle Life is doing is an entirely new thing. It's as big a shift as was the shift when it went from Avon only paying on personal productivity to Watkins paying on two levels. That was a monstrous shift. It was an incredible shift when Amway came along and proved that you could do a business for decades at a time. And that it wasn't just about being first, that you can be first and create a company that goes through multiple S curves. You can make this a career. You can make it a life. You can. Amway proved that and continues to on a monthly basis, on an annual basis. Then we saw in the 1980s, a group of companies come along that, again, proved that you can build a multiple billion dollar company that will stand the test of time and still be here year after year after year. There's so much to learn from those. The most important lessons that we have to learn in this group are the lessons that have been taught between 1990 and today, literally now. And it's my belief, we'll know, we'll know looking back, but it's my belief that 20 years from now, when people talk about the evolution of the industry, that they will be talking about this company and the changes that this company is making to meet the needs of the market today. And um, because I've talked to you for an hour already, and I'm thinking that's going to bounce off your brain, I'm going to make that the topic of our next session um, because I don't want this to drag on, I'll probably, and, I, and I, I know that I promised you all, you only have to be on one session per week. Um, my guess is that I'll do another one midweek this week to finish this content. And for those who can't be on it, then no problem. You can watch the recorded version, but I want to get this content behind. The reason it's so very important to me is because if this content does for you what it does for me, it gives me belief that if I do what I've been asked to do, that I can get paid for a long, long, long time. Now, of course, that's easy for me to believe because of what my experience has been, but it needs to be that same set of facts. Make it, and I look again, Steve, at you as my example. You're a good guy. People trust you. They respect you. You've had success in your life, and yet you're so frozen in fear behind the doubts, fears, and insecurities that are network marketing that the days they come and they go and they come and they go without productivity, right? That's fair enough, isn't it? And so if I can somehow help you understand why what we're doing is not just good, but it's very good. It's not just very good, but it's better than if you were if you were just getting out of medical school as a thoracic surgeon. It is better than that. If I can get you to understand that, then all of a sudden that which up until now has been trying to grab a cloud, maybe will become a little bit more tangible like grabbing this pen. So folks, my uh, final thoughts for today are, you all heard me say over and over again that it's about measuring inputs and uh, having confidence and faith in outcomes. That doesn't change the fact that we're at the end of the month. And at the end of the month, it is about doing everything we possibly can to be as productive and effective as we possibly can. Remember, people are watching you. Whether or not you know it, people are watching you. Make sure that what they see is good. Okay. That being said, everybody had a wonderful night, beautiful Sunday evening. And uh, probably on Sunday, but I'll put the message out there. Okay. God bless everybody. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.